It looks like a festival and sounds like a festival. But this is direct action. Day three of the Extinction Rebellion. We're blocking roads, it's going to cost the government money. They can't get milk to Tesco's. We have to take global action, and it's only the government that can do that. They're not doing it, that's why we're here. Protesters are occupying major landmarks across London and Edinburgh, sitting in, closing roads, gluing themselves to trains, and causing disruption to thousands of businesses and commuters. They've had a couple of days of disruption and they may well have, you know, been late for work or late home for work and someone tweeted me last night and said they were late for their daughter's birthday party and, of course, we all want to be at our daughter's birthday party on time, but what about his granddaughter's birthday party? What's happening today is about tomorrow, not just the inconvenience today. Greenhouse gases are 43% less than they were in the 1990s, so there, there has been some progress. Yes, good, there has been a degree of progress. We've made the easy progress. You know what it's like when you start trying to change things? The, the easy things topple first. We're now into the difficult part of the game. We've got 12 years, and that's a tangible period of time. You and I can remember what we were doing 12 years ago. We hope to know what we're going to be doing in 12 years' time. I'd rather we were living on a healthy planet at that point, but I don't think that we are going to achieve that if we wait for our politicians to act. And this is the people acting. Ten years ago, the UK was a pioneer in environmental policy. It created the first Climate Change Committee and set a series of targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But the Extinction Rebellion believes that momentum has been lost, something the Environment Secretary appeared to concede. The point's been made. Let's make sure that we now move to a stage where we have a serious conversation about what we can do. Mm. Now, the UK, under our governments of different parties, has played a role in reducing carbon emissions and, at the same time, growing the economy. So we have shown that you can do both. But I think, yes, there is more to be done, and we need to make sure that we have a serious conversation about the role that Britain can play. <laughs> If you look at the amount emitted per country, the country that's emitting the most is China, hugely. Uh, secondly is the USA. But if we look at the amount emitted per person in the country, China of course has a large number of people. The top ranking countries are the USA and then Australia and Canada. Um, the UK is about eighth and actually emitting per capita the same as the Chinese. Everybody here is committed to fighting climate change, but the group behind the protest has some specific goals, including a citizens' assembly and an aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2025. That's just six years, so if they are going to make that work, what has to happen? One of their stated aims is zero carbon emissions in sort of the next five or six years, but that would mean massive changes for individuals, wouldn't it? Basically, no flights, no cars, yeah. a huge increase in, in renewable energy. Yeah. Is that really possible? Can well, that really happen? I think what you do, you aim for the stars to get to the sky, don't you? And you aim for the sky to climb to the top of the tree. I think we have to set far more ambitious targets to spur people into thinking about this. Three days of largely peaceful protest has seen more than 300 arrests. These police were filmed moving into Parliament Square earlier tonight. The cost of the protest is already being estimated in the millions, a measure of success for a group which views disruption as its main weapon in the fight against climate change. Joining me is Farhana Yamin from Extinction Rebellion and Lord Barker, who served as Minister of State for Climate Change in David Cameron's government. Welcome to both of you. If I could start with you, Farhana. I mean, today, uh, you could understand perhaps why you might target roads, but actually there was disruption to public transport, which I would assume you want people to use. Well, it was very for a very short period of time, and it was a, a new method that uh, the group was trying out, and uh, I think the feedback on it, they're still assessing that. There was actually a huge spike in interest from people in the aims of Extinction Rebellion Isn't the feedback just going to be people I, complaining on social media, well, I can't get to work? Well, you'd be surprised that some people are genuinely very interested. I'm not saying everybody is interested. Obviously, people are... Uh, annoyed and cross and journeys are disrupted but what's the point of the disruption I guess everyone's asking and you know the point of the disruption is in some way to make you think about what are your personal priorities and they're to make the nation think what are priorities can we, if can you're we come so annoyed 
just about your two hour delay, you're very unlikely to be you know, that caring about what happens to the planet in 10 years time, in five years time in, two, in your children. So I you need to recalibrate things. alienating some of those people, a lot of them. I mean, a two hour delay is not a small amount and people do have to get to work to earn money. And just talking of money. Or pick up their kids or yes. go to hospital. OK, well, I'm more than capable of making that argument for myself for just a moment. But I'll bring you in on the government side of it. I, I think in terms of, you know, getting businesses on board, you don't want to punish small businesses. You may understand why you go outside Shell, but there's been businesses that have lost millions because of this disruption we totally understand that there are businesses that are disrupted that are individual journeys that are disrupted but we're asking people to to examine why this is happening to examine why we're now suddenly finding that we're at you know a 10-year cliff edge in terms of cl the climate and ecological emergency so the disruption is designed to wake people up and i'm sorry that that disruption is causing people to be delayed for work. It's not that we don't value what they're doing, it's just that the system has kind of broken down and people need to be aware of, of where we are in terms okay, of the so emergency. You, you say the system's broken down. If I bring you in at this point, Lord Barkey, the, the government has taken its eye off the ball when it comes to climate change, hasn't it? Well, I think the debate has moved away from climate change. So first of all, I think it's great that we're here on Newsnight talking about climate change and not banging on about Brexit. Don't worry, that's so, coming next. <laughs> but, that's, but it is really good and I think focusing public opinion on this is absolutely right because there is a climate emergency but I think alienating people by gluing yourself to, tra to trains or driving people into, ta into, uh, you know, into cars rather than on the tube is the wrong way to go about it and actually we've done some fantastic but things on, in this they, country. If they weren't doing that you wouldn't be on Newsnight right, right now. No, no, in all seriousness the first thing one of the very first things Theresa May did as Prime Minister do you know what that was? Tell me. Abolish the climate change department. No, no, that what she didn't debolish. That was my department, so I was yes, very I attracted know, but to it. Yes, I know, but you weren't in it when she was there. what she did was take climate change and put it into the business department, so it now sits at the heart of the, of the economy, rather than being the smallest department in Whitehall. Okay. Let's just see what, what has the government done. Since, since um, 1990, Britain has cut its carbon emissions by 44%. We took this challenge on to reduce our emissions by 2050 by 80 percent and we're already halfway there so that didn't happen on. that didn't happen by chance we're getting rid of coal we've got a massive increase Sorry, you say in... we're getting rid of coal but could i attach some facts to that Please why do the european union and their figures say that the uk is the european leader in subsidizing fossil fuels because that's not coal we're getting rid of, we've almost eradicated coal completely and uh, we'll have got coal no, but, will have gone by but, 2025. But, but you could say one thing and not be doing something in a completely different area. You say it's an emergency, yeah, but, but we are the leader in subsidising fossil let's fuels. Let's have a couple more statistics. We've cut carbon emissions by 44%. We've seen emissions from the energy sector fall by nearly 60%. We've seen emissions from transport fall significantly. We've seen what about homes? For homes, more challenging. More and challenging, much, isn't it? Much... Because that target was removed and that ability to help homes actually insulate their homes, that was removed I as agree. well. I agree. We need to, uh, the built environment when is you say somewhere more we need challenging, to... That's exactly what this particular group may feel like not going to their work today and the next day and the next day because it's not being treated as an emergency. I agree with a lot of, a lot of what you say. But I think what I, what I think, though, that we need to bring people together and form a consensus rather than risk alienating people with extreme action. But you're absolutely right. Getting us on the programme ha has had that benefit. But I think long term, I'm actually just more optimistic that there are solutions out there and want to reward people for making the right choices rather than stop them getting to work. OK, fine. They've got this extra two hours because they can't get to work, some of these people. You want them to focus on the next steps. Your action plan is a little bit thin on the ground. I think uh, one thing I can agree with Lord Barker is there's lots and lots of solutions and actually we can decarbonise much faster. The costs of renewable energy, of green technologies has plummeted so they are now more than cost effective. They out so outbeat uh, coal and fossil fuels and what's sad is that this government has kind of gone backwards it's subsidizing to a large extent the fossil fuel industries it's subsidizing shale gas it's, it's promoting <laughs> fracking can i just finish just finish that point it's, it's it's promoting fracking it's increasing our aviation uh, uh, emissions and by and large you know we that big drop in emissions that we had and the cut in coal uh, 
uh, station generation, you know, we outsourced most of our manufacturing to China. So if you include all of those factors together, if you look at international aviation and shipping, all of those things, our emissions are not that healthy. Uh, and we're not really playing the kind of leadership role that, you know, is suggested by this sort of absolute but figure. This, this, that this, 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 that? this subsidy of fossil fuels, do you know what the, the primary source of the subsidy is? It's going to help the poor, the most vulnerable, the elderly heat their home, the winter fuel payments, the win you know, and, the, and the extra welfare benefits that allow people to keep their health. Now, in the long term, we want people to live in homes that are, that are easier to heat. And ease, but at the moment, that does mean keeping people warm in the winter, and allowing them to put it, their gas fire. Isn't that a fair point in the sense of your, your target, just, just to remind everyone, 2025 you want to hit this by. But actually, isn't there an argument that if you do this too quickly, too fast, that the poorest will be hit? They will struggle to heat their homes, food prices will go up, so they'll struggle to feed their families. And then you risk alienating people on this journey. Sure. sure the and, you know, climate justice and dealing with vulnerable communities is very much at the heart of the principles that Extinction Rebellion and nearly every group is actually espousing. No one is saying punish the poor and punish those who are fuel poor in any way. So that's a sort of false argument. But, no, but, but I'd really your, like your to stress, actually, could be doing that. energy efficiency is one of the most cost effective ways of improving uh, of fuel poverty and, and, and generating wealth in the household. And again, that's been cut in the programs for making our very old poor housing stock more energy efficient has not been supported but what it, has been supported is a massive increase in roads a massive increase in spending to the h2s uh, link which is not going to benefit ev everyone equally in any way and what's been supported is fracking and the shale industry so and aviation as i said all high-end uh, uh, policies that, that 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 support essentially the richer people in society. But there has been progress. I mean, there are targets. There is movement towards that. I mean, Friends of the Earth say it would be extremely ambitious to reach the target that you would like to be carbon neutral by 2045. Nowhere near 2025. So where have you got that number from? Well, the from? government is currently the government's own uh, climate change committee, which is the advisory body that, uh, you know, sort of, uh, is, is advises the government on its long-term targets and on its carbon budgets. That's already said that, you know, the UK is not on track to meet its fourth or its fifth carbon budget. Do, do you, so do there you aren't enough that? policies. As in, that, you that's think, a fact. Do you, no, no, as in, do you agree, though, that in terms of it's not on track, Fine, I accept that's a fact, but that it's not actually being focused on as well at the moment. Because you made the joke, we're not talking about Brexit, yeah. but Brexit has taken the energy out of so I agree. much, like, we can, including Don't this. get me wrong, this is, I'm not making any sort of argument for complacency. There's a lot more we can do. We could do more on innovation. We could, certainly could have more, we would benefit from a greater political focus. But what I don't want what I don't want to do is take away from the fantastic innovation, the investment and the energy that there is in the low carbon economy. If you look at Britain's now the centre for electric vehicles, that's come because of government support. We've got a fantastic um, en uh, energy secretary, Claire Perry, who really gets gets this agenda and is certainly doing a lot to, to push it further. But the budget that, that uh, you're talking about, that's the 2050 uh, aim to get to reduce by 80 percent. And what I am keen to see is that 80 percent target in 2050 get cut to 100%. So we're at net zero. But in and the we meantime, can carry on saying it's, it's more so process. Net zero was final set one, as a goal answer. in Paris, and it's taken Claire Perry three years just to trigger the review to ask the Climate Change Committee. So that's the kind of complacency and tardiness, frankly, that is being challenged today on the streets. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us.